Okay, welcome to a PowerPoint presentation for um, history of glazes, brief history. Um, I just want to show you where you can find these presentations if you um, want to explore them on your own. Um, you can go over here to um, the Canvas home page right here and um, if you scroll down, you'll be able to find presentations right here um, where they're all listed. Um, and all of the links um, in all of these presentations will work. So you're welcome to, you know, follow along in, uh, with this Panopto um, presentation, or you're welcome to look at these on your own. Okay, so here we go. Um, Okay, brief history and basic description of glazes. Um, there's kind of a lot to go over, um, and there's definitely going to be some vocabulary you're going to have to get used to. Um, you probably already heard me talk about this stuff in class, um, but, you know, just to kind of reemphasize it. Um, vitrification, right here, um, that's the uh, solidification of a melt into a glass, basically, at higher temperatures, when I talk about a ceramic being vitrified, it means all of the silica uh, has melted in the clay body and um, in the clay, and it's basically become watertight. That's that's you know pretty much the uh, you know the basic description. Um, then in, uh, another really important uh, vocab word is going to be flux. Um, these are all oxides that. Uh, lower the melting or softening temperature of a mix of materials. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, refractory uh, is definitely really important. Um, it refers to a material that doesn't melt. Um, so when we talk about refractory materials or adding refractory materials, it means we're trying to prevent something from melting. Um, uh, most refractory materials would, would be like um, uh, anything with alumina or silica in it. So we're talking clay. Um, we're talking alumina hydrate and um, silica. Okay, uh, craze, you'll hear me talk about crazing. These are little uh, hairline cracks in a glaze surface, um, and that usually occurs because the glaze, after it melts and cools, will shrink more than the clay body it's sitting on and form these little cracks. Um, they can be considered glaze defects or they can be an asset. It kind of depends on what your motives are. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that um, and especially focus more um, during uh, when we talk about glaze faults. Okay. Um, all right. So <clears throat> some of the first um, known glazes uh, to be manufactured and utilized with knowledge um, are Egyptian pastes. Um, these uh, occurred a couple thousand years ago, obviously, during um, the uh, Egyptian um, times, you know, BC. Um, and basically, these were clays. Um, humans figured out a way to um, utilize salt. Um, and so it, it's been known that uh, many salt deposits. Um, were gathered from the deserts and then those sources of sodium were added to clay uh, which then once the clay dried um, the uh, sodium would navigate to the surface of the clay and then um, sodium melts at a low temperature and it would cause uh, the formation of a little glass or or a glaze basically um, on the surface of the pot they also added um, copper uh, which they were able to mine at, from ore and uh, manufacture. Um, it, was, it was a very expensive process. Um, and uh, you could probably assume that anyone who had or owned one of these pieces or one of these pieces of pottery, or if they were using um, clay beads uh, as decoration, was a sign of wealth and social stature. Um, so these are actual examples of uh, Egyptian paste pottery. Um, then throughout history, um, as kiln 
technology began to grow, uh, you know, different cultures were able to um, obtain higher temperatures, which led to the utilization of wood being the source of the surface and design um, because uh, trees, when they're alive and they're growing, um, they are absorbing materials through their roots. And a lot of those materials are minerals and those same mineral and those minerals are the same um, ingredients that we use to manufacture and melt glazes. Um, and so what happens is in this particular process is as the wood is burning, um, the ash in the kiln during the firing process, the ash will deposit on the uh, pottery. And many times the ash or the pottery doesn't have any glaze on them. Um, as in these examples, these are Kevin Crow pots. Kevin Crow is an American potter in Virginia. Um, he's one of my favorites. Um, you can see how the ash, when it builds up in these thicker areas here, um, it, it, will, it will build up and then as the kiln approaches temperatures over 2000 degrees, it will begin to melt all of those materials um, and form these kind of random, um, you know, runs or these random surfaces with these random colored um, flashings. And what you'll see is in these thicker areas, the, the physical characteristics of the oxides involved, whether it's like sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, those types of um, characters, characteristics will be more dominant. Whereas in these areas where it deposited a lot thinner, then the relationship of the clay, the nature of the clay will become more dominant. Um, and you'll, you'll see, you know, the iron that's in the clay that will begin to flash and create more earth tones. Um, and so depending on, you know, the materials used um, and the wood that's used, you can have quite a variety of different um, surfaces including allowing a lot of ash to build up. So as you can see on this pot right here, this was actually fired in a horizontal position. Um, and this was probably closer to the firebox and you can see a lot of the ash right here. It was allowed to build up quite a bit, um, which made these really um, strong drips, these really thick drips and things like that. Um, that is all planned. So then on the bottom side where there's less ash, you can see a lot more of um, just the clay and the sheen of the clay that's created. Um, over on this one, um, this could have been, you know, throughout the kiln, not really sure, um, but it has a, a really good amount of ash deposit on it. Um, and it also looks like it has a glaze on the inside, um, which you can do. Um, but anyways, what I'm getting at is it, it, these kilns cool really slowly and sometimes you'll see, uh, especially with uh, alkali earths, which is calcium, magnesium, um, you'll get a lot of crystallization, um, which you see right here. So that's from a really slow cooling process that allows the crystallization to occur. Um, so anyways, it's a, quite a variety of different surfaces. Um, this uh, uh, is getting back to something more simple. Um, you can actually create um, glazed surfaces. Um, and this is actually really traditional throughout history um, by using really fine clays. Um, and if you can get your temperatures over 2000 degrees, you'll, you'll surely melt some of these clays. Um, you can see over here in this tile, um, this clay actually is really nice. Um, when it's fired to this particular temperature range, not sure, probably somewhere close to 2000 degrees. Whereas, um, with, you know, with experimentation, you can figure these things out. So with really, with the really fine particles of clay, you could, you could brush these types of materials on your clay pots and fire them to, you know, anywhere between 18 to maybe 2100 degrees and get a really nice sheen. Um, Anything past that, obviously with this particular clay, you can, it will start to volatize and it will release gases and it will bubble. Um, so you can use clays, just simple clay slips as a glazing surface, as a vitrified surface. Um, but it, it just takes a little bit of 
um, understanding and knowledge um, of the material and a little bit of experimentation in firing different temperature zones. Many times these slips that have like a lot of basalt or a lot of iron will melt and create these really nice sheen surfaces, um, you know, roughly between 1800 to, you know, maybe 21 to 2200 degrees. Okay, um, this is um, a little bit more advanced. Um, these are examples of when glazes, a, a time of when glazes started to become um, a lot more sophisticated in the fact that um, potters began to understand different um, found materials, local materials, and have experimented for centuries to kind of attain these really stable glazed surfaces. Um, these feldspathic glazes, um, they're called feldspathic because one of the main source materials is a feldspar. Feldspars typically have some sort of um, alkali associated with them. So their chemical formulas are usually an alkali and then alumina and silica, um, which is the basic three materials that you need to form a stable glaze. Um, the alkali, it would be referred to a flux, um, which lowers the melting temperature of silica. Um, and so with these particular glazes, um, the source material would have been a feldspar that's probably more of a sodium or a potassium feldspar. The most popular feldspars that we use um, and that we have in our studio uh, would be one uh, potassium feldspar uh, named Custer feldspar, which the dominant alkali is potassium, along with other trace materials. Uh, we'll get involved with that later. Um, there are also other feldspars like nepheline cyanide or nephsi um, or minspar 200 that are sodium based um, feldspars. So that means that uh, the dominant alkali would be sodium. Um, these glazes have mixtures of clay, feldspar, sometimes salts, um, and they were brushed on. And this was a time in the uh, 16th century Japan um, where these um, glazes, you know, lived, had popularity for maybe about 50 to 75 years. These are, this is a Shino glaze. It's a very simple glaze fired to over 2000 degrees with the kiln technology. Um, and you can see here this green glaze, which again is a feldspathic glaze. It's not, oops, it's not as opaque um, as this particular glaze. This is more opaque, probably has a little bit more clay in it. Um, this favors more of the metal itself or the alkali itself, which would be most likely sodium. Um, and it also has copper in it, which at that particular time was definitely a sign of uh, social stature. Um, that copper was uh, very expensive um, to obtain um, five, 600 years ago. Um, and so uh, this was definitely a, a, a well sought after material. Okay, um, moving on to another type of um, glazing process. This definitely has origins in Western Europe and the early Americas. Um, where actual salt or soda, uh, sodium-based materials were um, introduced into the kiln during um, top temperatures of the firing process. Um, and you'll probably recognize a lot of this pottery. This is definitely um, typical American colonial time pottery <clears throat> um, with brushworks of cobalt and decoration. Um, sorry about that. And what happens um, is potters will actually take salt um, or uh, a source of soda called sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate is a, a natural and abundant material that you can find. Um, and if you mix it with water and then spray that solution into the kiln at top temperature, um, that uh, solution will instantly vaporize above 2000 degrees <clears throat> and it will uh, 
uh, form on the surface and begin to form a, a glass, um, more of a, a see-through, you know, more of a clear type of, of surface. Um, salt will do the same thing. You literally, there's different ways to introduce salt into the kiln. You can literally shovel it into the kiln or you can put it on wood, depending if you're firing with wood or not. You just pour salt on the wood flats and then um, just throw that into the into the chamber where you want the salt to accumulate on all the pottery. Um, and uh, you would probably want to introduce depending on how large your chamber is, a potters would probably introduce anywhere between two pounds to, you know, maybe five, six, seven, eight pounds of salt into their kiln chamber. You can see over here on this example, this um, would be an example of a lot of salt. Um, and um, this particular surface is, um, could be considered a glazed effect. Um, but in this case, it's actually the characteristic the um, potter is going for. It's referred to as orange peel. And basically, that's a result of, um, it's the characteristic of what sodium will do as it melts and kind of runs and accumulates on the pot. It's basically, um, it, it's behavior at top temperatures. Uh, so anyways, um, it forms this really beautiful surface. And with the addition of cobalt um, here, it will take up that cobalt and turn the um, glassy glaze surface blue. Okay, um, so now we're going to basic composition of glaze. Um, again, you've heard me talk about fluxes and feldspars. Um, and basically the fluxes would be alkali earths, alkali metals, um, other metals like zinc and lead. Um, we don't use lead anymore, thank God. Um, so I'll mainly in this class course be focusing on the, um, the earth, um, the alkali earths and metals and other metals like zinc. Um, uh, so, um, basically, um, you know, what you'll come across, you'll also, I, I guess I should just back up and explain, um, that many of these. Um, materials, like when I say oxides, I'm talking about a particular element that's in oxide form. So, for example, um, an alkali metal would be sodium oxide. So that would be, you know, a sodium molecule with a molecule of oxygen. Um, so you'll see that represented as NaO. Um, I should probably add a little slide in here. Maybe I'll do that. Anyways. Uh, so the three the three main characteristics of glazes is the flux, and I just explained what those are. They help melt silica. Okay, they lower the melting temperature of silica. Typically, silica I think it melts above three thousand degrees, um, and so to get that glass that glassy part of the glaze, um, when you add it to these other materials, it will lower its melting temperature into Temperature zones that we can use as potters roughly anywhere between 1800 to 2400 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the other third material is basically clay um, and it's considered a stabilizer or a neutral. And so what can happen is if you have a lot of flux along with a lot of silica, you can have a really, really runny glaze and it can fall off of your pot. Um, and so with the addition of clay, um, then it will change the physical characteristics of the clay. It will create a more viscosity in the melt and it will hold the clay or it will hold the glaze onto the pot as it melts. It will also add hardness to your glaze. It will also add opacity to your glaze. Many times clay is the source of colorants, which would be an iron, um, which you can see over here in Matt Long's pottery, these orange flashes are from the clay in the glaze. Um, these black marks are from, this is probably a, a salt fired um, uh, pot. I'm pretty sure they are. Matt Long is pretty well known for that type of process. And so the black comes from um, carbon, the smoke inside of the kiln during the firing. Um, and then along with these orange flashes. Okay. All right, so let's just kind of move on to different 
um, categories of temperature. Um, you can see here, um, this is Bede Clark. Uh, Bede Clark, again, is an American potter. I believe he's in charge of the University of Missouri's uh, ceramics program. Um, he's a really well-known American potter. These are all wood-fired pots, um, and they're, they're really nice. <laughs> okay, let's start off. So there's different temperature zones. We'll go it with, uh, we'll start with low temperature. Um, these are basically bisque temperatures, so anywhere between 06 and 04. Um, typically, um, these were, these type of temperatures were used for thousands of years until kiln technology really began to allow potters to go close above 2000 degrees. Um, a lot of times these types of Temperature surfaces are just natural clays, or in some time, like with earthenware, uh, earthenware and terracotta, uh, many cultures still just fire their clay raw and allow the fire to leave a print on the vessel. You'll see a lot of that with African pottery or with a low fire technique that we refer to as raku. Um, but if we're using uh, glazes like this Lisa ore pot, um, then we can use different materials in, in previous, in, well, as far, late as 1970s, people were using lead. Um, lead was an absolutely fantastic material for melting things, and it provided a tremendous amount of color response. The problem is, is that it's very poisonous, so we don't, we don't use lead anymore. Um, uh, you could use fritted materials. Um, frits are basically man-made versions of uh, glasses or feldspars that are then pulverized into a really fine powder that have specific um, amounts of oxides that we need that we cannot find in nature. So for example, um, you'll see a frit 31, I think it's 3134, which is a boron silicate and calcium frit um, with, without a lot of impurities. And so that can be really advantageous um, if you need a specific characteristic at a specific firing temperature. Um, for example, like these low firing temperatures. So if you want something that's really glassy, that doesn't have um, a lot of cracks in it, a lot of crazing in it, um, then you would need to use a frit to get this really beautiful um, surface. Okay, um, th there are also a lot of industrial glazes. Um, so companies like Amico, um, they'll make um, glazes that you know you can just paint onto your pots and they're really stable and they're really great. Um, however, you don't know what's in them. <laughs> so it's hard to you know do any experimentation with them. Um, then there's another process called myolica, which is a low fire um, uh, process where you basically use um, a white based glaze and then you can paint colored pigments on top of it and those colored pigments will melt into the white base glaze as it melts. Um, I don't know a lot of, a whole lot about myolica. I, I've only used it uh, a couple of times. I think there's a lot of tin in it. Um, which allows it to melt really low and be really opaque white. It's a really beautiful surface. Um, and many times the surfaces will appear to be watercolor-like. Uh, the next range would be mid-range, which is what we fire to in cone 6. But this range you could roughly say from cone 4 to cone 7. Um, it's debatable. <laughs> Anyways, um, with this... Uh, temperature zone, um, we're definitely um, getting closer to more vitrified surfaces. Um, a lot more dense um, ceramic bodies. Um, we'll be using, you can use stoneware and porcelain clay bodies at these temperatures. Um, typically, you'll be using, um, uh, you know, some of the interchangeable um, high temperature fluxes, like, um, calcium carbonate, otherwise known as whiting or talc. Um, we'll also be using lithium at this um, particular temperature zone. Lithium is a really great source material for this mid-range. You'll also see a lot of borates, so calcium borates, which 
um, form really, really stable, beautiful glasses at this temperature. So for example, you'll um, be using Laguna Borate, um, which we have uh, at this particular temperature range um, in association with some of the other um, feldspars and alkali uh, source materials. Um, the next would be high fire, which we refer to high fire, which is cone 8 to 12, roughly, you know, 2250 degrees Fahrenheit to like maybe 2450, um, which would be up in the cone 12, 13. Sometimes um, potters get into cone 14. That's really, really, really hot. Um, um, those are mainly like wood firing potters. And so... Um, they're making those choices because of a particular aesthetic choice and strategy in firing. Most of the time, potters in high fire will stay between nine, cone nine and 11. Um, and these are really, <coughs> excuse me, um, really stable glazes. They're fully vitrified. They're fully watertight. Um, most of the time, as the notes will say here, they're mostly alkali earth and metal fluxes. <coughs> Um, and you have a wide variety of surfaces and colors um, and a number of different firing strategies for color response. Um, this is Elena Ranker. Um, she's New Zealand potter. She's become one of my favorites. Um, she fires with wood and I do believe she uses gas, um, but she needs what's referred to as reduction to get some of these color responses. A lot of times these high fire um, potters are using some sort of fuel source. Um, there's typically no reason to go to cone 10 in oxidation or by using an electric kiln. It's kind of a waste of energy. Um, and most of the time, if you're using oxidation, the anywhere between cone 04, or I'm sorry, between cone 06 and cone 6 is fine. So what I'm getting at is usually if you see these high fire um, you know, glazes or temperatures, we're talking about using reduction to get color response and therefore using some sort of combustible fuel source. Okay, um, now we're gonna get into glaze surface and texture. Um, there's all sorts of different um, uh, surfaces we can obtain. Um, and it's also determined by uh, the temperature range that we wanna fire to. Um, and that will get into a whole strategy in selection of materials and different ratios um, in order to obtain the type of melt and surface we want at a particular temperature range. So typically, you know, when you're getting into glaze formulation, you want to know uh, what temperature you're firing to before you begin, because that will give you the uh, that will give you uh, a set of materials that you can choose from. Um, there's also something that I want to talk about real quick, which is alumina silica ratio. Um, this is a really important calculation um, that you'll find literally on a molecular scale, um, a one to one ratio. So it'd be one alumina uh, to one silica ratio. That would be one to one. Um, the higher the silica content, the more glossy the glaze will be. So for example, um, if I have a a lumina silica ratio of 1 to 14, then that means there's a lot more silica and that means it's going to be a lot more glossy. Okay. Um, anywhere in the middle, like around uh, 7, 8, 9, we're going to have something that's kind of satin. Um, anything lower than that in the 3, 4, 5 range is going to be more of a matte. Um, and I will get more into that right now. Okay. So these are matte surfaces. Um, there are different ways to achieve matte surfaces. You can either use this, you can use a strategy of usually an alkali earth. Um, alkali earths like calcium and magnesium, they form crystalline structures. And so if given proper ratios and proper, you know, um, uh, you know, firing process, then they'll basically kind of mat out the surface by forming crystal structures, making the glaze opaque. Um, there's also, you can add clay to the glaze that will also increase its opacity. Um, and there's also the silica alumina ratio. 
Um, and you can see here the lower amount of silica you add to the, a melting glaze, then the more dry it will become. Um, and typically matte surfaces range between two and six. Okay, this is a satin. Um, a satin matte is kind of right in between, you know, a matte and a gloss. They're typically opaque. Um, they usually have just like a buttery sheen to them. And again, you can attain this through a strategy of a silica alumina ratio from 6 to 10. You should also consider using crystalline material, crystallizing materials like alkali earths. Um, you, at this temperature range, you could also include zinc. Zinc is a crystallizing agent. Um, and so um, barium, magnesium, calcium, and small amounts of zinc will help um, create um, crystalline structures in the glaze, which will then, you know, uh, opacify the glaze. Um, and because you have a higher silica alumina ratio, then that means the glaze is going to be a little bit more glassy in its melt. And so that's what will help um, give it that kind of buttery sheen. Um, you can also use um, a different opacifiers. We refer to them as opacifiers. Um, Zerocopax and tin are just two of several that we can use, but they are what we have in our studio. Um, the, this would be an example of a gloss glaze right here, this green, green glaze that you can really see through it. Um, this is Sean Spangler's work. Uh, it's, he does some pretty interesting pouring vessels, um, and he has these really beautiful alkali uh, uh, glossy glazes. Um, this one would have um, probably copper in it to give it that green hue. Um, and what I, uh, usually these glazes favor alkali metals like sodium and potassium. Um, they do not crystallize. Uh, they give these really glassy melts. Um, and then with a silica lumina ratio of 10 to 14, you could probably get a glossy glaze at 9. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, usually right around this range, you'll have um, a really nice glossy see-through glaze. All right. Um, and so just real quick, I want to touch on um, the final parts, the, you know, the firing process. Um, we have different firing strategies, oxidation. Um, and then uh, we fire oxidation here in the studio. So that's what we'll be focusing on. Um, but there are other ways of firing with reduction, um, and reduction is a strategy in order to create um, react color responses due to the change of the atmosphere inside the kiln. Um, reduction would be reducing the amount of oxygen inside the kiln during firing. You need a combustible source um, to obtain that type of atmosphere, and basically a reduced amount of oxygen will create an inefficient burn. And so what happens is the combustion process will begin to burn the oxygen that's connected, that's um, contained inside the ceramic materials. And most of the time it will burn up the oxygen that's connected to the metals inside the glaze. And it will change the um, characteristic of the metal and therefore present a different type of color. Um, there are other um, uh, sources for reduction firing. You can use wood, you can use gas, propane, and oil. Um, and the other thing I want to touch on as well as you can see, um, you know, an, uh, that heat work is really important. Um, and so right here you can see these are cones. Um, this is a system that was developed to uh, standardize different um, uh, firing temperatures and firing zones for potters and for the industry. Basically what goes on here is uh, you, you can't just fire to a typical temperature. Um, you, you have to fire uh, to a temperature range and that's based on heat work. And so for example if I am firing at 50 degrees per hour and let's just say I'm firing at 200 degrees per hour. Um, that's really fast at top temperatures. And so my 
the melting temperature to actually bend this cone over will be a higher Fahrenheit temperature. So if I'm melting, you know, if I'm if I'm firing at 200 degrees per hour, let's just say my fire my melting temperature would be like 2,050 degrees, and that would be different if I were firing at 50 degrees per hour. 50 degrees per hour would allow more of the heat to penetrate through the material, and it would actually lower the melting temperature to, you know, let's just say 1950. Um, so there's a whole strategy um, in developing a firing schedule to get things to melt at a proper um, firing temperature, depending on the heat work, um, which is why these cones are a more um, uh, uh, standardized way to melt or to know if your glazes are melted because you basically engineer to melt your glazes um, when these cones melt over. And that can be an indicator on how uh, your glazes are melted. All right, well, that's, uh, that's about all I got for you today. So feel free to um, go back and check out this um, presentation, check out some of the links, um, and uh, let me know if you have any questions.